Yeah. Awesome. So thanks everyone who's joining us. Um, for those of you in the audience know that there's a larger audience on zoom right now. So you guys get the pleasure of, of meeting Damara in person. Um, but we're going to get started and, uh, Damar, <laughs> he came very fully prepared to, uh, to give you a full on lecture, um, on his background and his lifestyle. But I told him that this is a very comfortable space and we try to keep it casual here and the conversation lively. So, um, I'm not going to waste too much time because we only have him for an hour. Um, welcome to the Innovators in Fashion Speaker Series hosted by Miami Fashion Institute. To all our students and audience, welcome as well. Um, we've been doing this now for about oof, three out of the five years that we've existed. Um, we host about three of these every semester. It is always with an industry professional, um, both near and far. And Damar was kind enough to fly in from California to come see y'all and to talk to you guys in person. I will also reveal that Damar is a former student of mine. Um, I don't know how long ago that was though, and I don't, I don't really wanna go there. So let's not do that. But he's also a former student of mine. Um, and so he's gonna share a little bit about his background and you know how he came into fashion. Um, I'll ask him a couple of questions and then you guys can ask him a couple of questions. So you know, while he's talking, if anything comes to mind or anything hits a nerve, um, keep hold on to that for a little bit and then you can ask him some questions, okay? All right, take it away, Damar. Cool. Hey guys, hope all is well. I'm excited to be here. This is my first time doing this, so bear with me. My name is Damar Fairbanks. I'm the senior apparel designer for Adidas Basketball. I design basketball collections for James Harden, Trey Young, and Candace Parker. I would like to share my story and hopefully it inspire you on your path to success and achieving those dreams that are meant for you. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, one of four children to a single mother. I took a slightly different path out of high school. I joined the army. I was 17 years old, didn't have much of a view of the world, but the training and experience that I got while I was in the military helped shape my organizational skills. Just a few highlights from my military career. I scored 303 times on a physical training test. That test consists of uh, how many push-ups and sit-ups you can do in two minutes and a 12-minute or a run, um, which you had to complete in 12 minutes. So I'm proud of that. Um, but the biggest thing I took from the military was the friendships. I met my friend Tony Kirk in Iraq. He kept me inspired and focused. We didn't know what we wanted to do after the military, so we started a t-shirt line. We didn't have any IG, social media, or Facebook to promote our business. So we use those connections that we met, that we made in the military to run our business. He was a businessman, I was the designer. And we use our, he used his friends in Ohio. I use, I mean, in Oklahoma, I use my friends in Ohio to move the t-shirts. Um, so um, after, um, after learning that I can achieve those success, I went to pursue a career in fashion. I went to Miami International University of Art and Design where I studied fashion design. I pretty much, just to circle back, uh, me joining the military afforded me the opportunity to go to college, but it was only enough money for an associate's degree. So I couldn't afford a bachelor's. So, what I did while I was in school was apply or compete in as many competitions as possible. Really anything I could do to put myself out there in the school and the community. Um, while I was in school, while I was in school, I did a few, few competitions and I ended up winning a, a few awards. I won a menswear award for my design and we, um, and the school, fashion office offered me an internship after that. I was also featured in a book called Emerging Designers, which my design was featured there with the inspiration and materials that I use for making that, making that collection. Um, so I got my internship with Perry Ellis. So this is where I learned the difference between school and the industry. I 
pretty much uh, learn software to make my designs come to life and learn the design process from start to finish. Yeah, I had to learn um, a material software called Euphoria. So that was basically CAD and materials, CAD and a fabric, and also um, learn Illustrator for the first time. We didn't learn Illustrator in school, so I picked it up when I was in the industry. Nice. How you doing with it? <laughs> yeah. So learn those programs and kind of learn the design process from start to finish. But things didn't work out there. I didn't get a job after my internship. So I went back to the store. I was working in retail at uh, Club Monaco on Collins Ave on South Beach. And my boss came up to me one day for an internship at corporate. And with me being in school and working at the store, she knew that I wanted to be a designer. So that's where I learned the importance of networking and making and building relationships. So long story short, I got the interview. I got the internship in design, working on men's blazers, pants, and denim. And I was gone, I was off from there. But the kicker was I wasn't getting paid for it. So the deal was that I would work three days in the store and work three days at corporate. So working three days in the store is not exactly a full paycheck, so I could barely afford to eat. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner was peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a gallon of water. I kept my, I kept my water outside because it was cold and the refrigerator was broke. So there you go, I had to do what I had to do. But needless to say, it all worked out in the end. I got hired as an assistant designer at Perry Ellis, so I moved back to Miami. And that's where things started. I went from assistant to associate in, in two years and got, got to work on my own categories. Um, I graduated from college, that's me. Yeah, and these are, these are the awards that um, I won while I was in school, the Men's Wear Award and also featured in the book. So, Perry Ellis, I was, a, I was the assistant designer for golf. So I worked on golf. Golf is pretty much prints, stripes, color, and traditional looks. So basically, that was my intro, my intro to the fashion industry through sport, which I love. I worked on I worked on um, collections for DA Points, who's a PGA Tour player. Oh. Worked on collections for PGA or for DA Points, and also other golfers that was in a collection. But sometimes you got to take a risk, and my time my, I had hit my ceiling at Perry Ellis, and felt like it was time for me to make a change. So I took a well-paying opportunity with Fruit of a Loom and designing underwear. So I never designed clothes that was tight to the body. So this was a learning curve. So what I did make a little history while I was in a company, I created the breathable underwear, which is a micro mesh fabric built from a performance silhouette. And we, um, and it was sold and Walmart, Kohl's, Macy's, and everywhere they sell Fruit of a Loom products. So six years later, that's, that underwear is still in store and can be found to this day. So proud of that. But underwear wasn't really my thing. I, the fit sessions was a little weird, if you can imagine. <laughs> um, and, I, and I wanted to get back in sport. So Under Armour called. And this is where I got to work on sports style. Sports style is basically um, UA positioned as a to, to the gym and from the gym component. So what do you wear to the gym and from the gym um, so through a lifestyle lens? So got to work on Under Armour. I mean, got to work on sports style. Things should kind of shook up at the company. And I began designing basketball. I never designed basketball before, but the culture, innovation, and overall aesthetic of basketball had me very interested. So I worked on basketball. 
This is my first basketball collection. It was inspired by 80 Celtics warm-ups and uniforms, which we created a dynamic range from. There's some of the highlights that I have from Under Armour, some of the basketball collection, the tearaway pant, the uh, printed windbreaker, the short with the T, and our graphic um, execution was a puff, uh, iridescent puff print. So things was going well at Under Armour. I was there for two and a half years and kind of got to the point where I was missing birthdays. I was missing weddings. So I wasn't able, I wasn't able to have a life outside of work. So I was burning out. So Under Armour non-competed me for six months, which means I couldn't work with a competitor for six months. And I would only take 60% of my salary to be off for work. So I took time off. I got to travel to Europe a couple times and I went to about five different states. The time off was good because I was able to strengthen my own portfolio and work on my creativity and energize my body. So after that eventful year off, it was time to go back to the industry. I got the opportunity with Puma, which was an exciting opportunity because Jay-Z had just became the creative director of basketball and I was gonna go and work on sports style. So that was exciting. I worked on women's wear and collaborations for about three seasons. And then I got to take a trip to Germany to present my work to the, head, head, the main headquarters in Herzo. So that was exciting. Here's some of my design highlights from Puma. This is a collaboration with First Mile. First Mile is a company out in Pittsburgh that does um, recycle, that makes clothes or yes, does recycle fabrics. And we made all of, all of the fabrics are from recycled materials uh, from empty or plastic water bottles. This is another collaboration I did with Cloud9. Cloud9 is a gaming company or esports company. And we did a men's and women's collection for them. And also, I did a collaboration with White Castles, which was cool because we got to uh, go back into the archives of White Castles. And they actually did apparel in the 80s. So we, had, we was able to pull some of those uh, inspirations and, and those references to be able to create our own collection. But my time had come to an end at Puma, and Adidas was at my door. So it was my time now. Thank you for letting me share my journey with you. Hopefully this inspires you on your own path to success. And I know it did for me. It was a long and tough road for 16 years, 11 of those in the corporate industry, but I'm here now. Thank you. This is so amazing. I'm like a proud mommy. Um, I'm always I always remember having you in class um and I think we had a moment where you turned in something <laughs> he got an A on it because he did what he was supposed to but he didn't do what I expected him to do which was more and I told him because I was like I could let this go I could be like oh I'm gonna give you an A but I was just like I kind of expected more when I mean, you got the A but who cares about the grade you could have done more um but there's so much to unpack in his journey because one of the reasons I wanted Damar to be here um, was because I know that he has seen the transition from what he thought fashion was to what fashion is, right? Um, fashion is a business, right? And so even when he's here and we were talking about the area that he works in within fashion, you know, um, chairperson Keter was here asking about the Yeezys and I'm like, that's not the, that's not the area he works in. He works in a different area. These companies are diced up into pieces and everybody's responsible for those pieces. Um, and he has gone from sort of being, uh, I think like a generalist in menswear to being a very specific type of designer. And that kind of is how you develop as a creative. You kind of are a generalist when you start. Um, and not to say that, that his journey is done because he may go back in that direction with like a men's suit line that with a sports slant. That's kind of the thing that's happening right now anyways, but you become a specific um, type of designer and the skills that are required, regardless of what area you design in, right? I know a lot of you are stressed 
about Adobe Illustrator. <laughs> Stressed is probably like the soft way of putting it, but that is a universal tool in the industry. Um, all the Adobe products, but specifically Illustrator because it's a vector program. Um, so, you know, think about that when you're, when you think about what fashion is, there's what you think it is, there's what consumers, the people that buy think it is, and then there's what it is, right? And behind the scenes, um, and the specificity of what you have to do when you work in the industry, um, the skills that you need to have that are kind of like transferable. Adobe has been around for a long time since I was in college. Um, and it's not going anywhere. So it, it is, it behooves you to master that particular skill set because it's going to work for you wherever you go within the industry. So let's go back. So you were in the military. Yes. You did well on the physical test. Yes. You're very proud of that. I'm very proud of it. If you took that test now, would you pass it? I probably wouldn't. <laughs> um, and so you came out, you started a t-shirt line, which is generally a way a lot of folks get started because it's an inexpensive kind of way of getting a thought out there. And, and that made you think, let me just see if I can make a career out of this. Yeah. So pretty much um, with the success of the tees, um, and we call it, I call it success because again, at the time there was no social media, it was nothing for me to promote our business. So everything was by word of mouth. So once we started selling the tees, me and him had conversations of us doing more than tees. So in order for me to learn that, I had to go to school. And he was a big proponent of that. So um, I made the decision to go to school for design and to learn the fundamentals of design and learn how to create bodies and different styles from scratch because school teaches you basically the basics and there's no production people, there's no development team that'll help you get your design through. You have to do it yourself. So that was where uh, I kind of got my intro into fashion and understanding like what, how, how to build a collection and how to tell stories. And there, I know like from the consumer side of it, they may not get it, although like the diehards will get it. But when you're telling a story, like when you talked about um, like the, you know, referencing retro uniforms to create a new, a new collection. Um, is that something else that you kind of had to learn, like how to sort of build a story when you're creating a collection so you can expand on it or have like longevity to it? Talk to us a little bit about that process. Yeah. So, um, it's very important to, to have a story that connects back to footwear, um, and sport usually, that consumer dresses from feet to head. So the footwear is very important. So it's it's key that we keep a lot of touch points with our footwear partners and our marketing team to understand how they want to deliver, how they want to launch the shoe or how they want to um, and how they want to tie that story into marketing and also um, also with apparel. So it's very important. Um, when you're telling stories and you see those marketing campaigns out there for athletes, um, you know that that's a collective holistic story that's been told by apparel, footwear, marketing, and those um, those other counterparts that allows it, that, that story to be conveyed. So it's a lot of money that goes behind these stories and the connectivity and also the authenticity to the athlete is, is very personal. So um, telling those stories that are true to them it allows the consumer facing to be um, a little bit more um, understandable and digestible. Um, and so now that you're you're at Adidas, you're working on Trey Young, um, and you know more personal brands, more custom collaborations. What do you think um, is like the next step for you? Because I, I imagine that at some point you want to go back to doing Damar. Or he used to be called Banks. Banks, <laughs> Banks, Banks, his own uh, collection at some point. So you've gathered all this information. You've had all this experience. You've seen how the machine works, yeah. right? From from concept to delivery to you know all of that. Are you thinking that one day you might want to go back to do your own sort of thing? Um, that's possible. Um, I actually journeyed down that way a little bit. Uh, about five years ago where I worked on a sample collection for myself 
So um, it's a lot of it's a lot of work and a lot of money. So you have to have backing, financial backing to really get what you want to do out there. But um, to answer your question, yeah, I think one day I eventually want to go back to doing my own thing. Um, once I learned and gather all the knowledge that I could, and once I made it a couple more steps in my career, I, I believe like once I get director level, then that's when I'll be able to have a different mind to put together my own brand. That'd be so cool. Yeah. Director Banks. <laughs> Direct, I, I hope you start going by Banks again. Director Banks. <laughs> Um, so does anybody have any questions and anybody like having any moments of like, oh, okay, I see why that's necessary. Go ahead, Pris. Oh, thank you. I need a microphone, but sure. Um, no, I, I was curious to, to hear a little bit more about what you were talking about just now in terms of, uh, relaunching your business, because when you first started, you had a business and you said it was, you felt like it was successful. Mm -hmm. So why do you feel like you need the uh, extra uh, things to make it successful a second time? I and think I um, experience is king. Um, I think it's always great to be able to learn from different creatives and different spaces and different um, companies because everybody works different. So I just think I need more knowledge along with capital. So um, I think once, once I gain the knowledge and experience that I'm looking for to be able to run a team, to be able to uh, really curate a look from concept all the way through production, I think that's when I'll be ready for it. So um, just that experience and, um, and, and, and knowing what to do and what not to do and how to deal with these factories and how to deal with these, um, these mills um, is the stuff that I, I really need to be able to go out there and launch again on my own without having that back in or that support of anyone else. And what do you, what, what was your, so before you got into fashion versus what you thought fashion was, like what was the biggest misconception from what you thought it was to what it ended up being? Like, what is your biggest misconception? Well, the biggest misconception is that it, there was a, like, I thought it was glamorous. I thought the industry was glamorous because what you see on TV, you see the fashion shows, you see the, the celebrities and these beautiful gowns and these beautiful suits, and you automatically think that's what you're going to be doing. But it's totally different. Like, it's a bunch of work. It's is if if you love what you do if you're passionate about it then it's not work but it's a lot of work to do this and th it, it wasn't as glamorous so i would say that <laughs> i mean the the glamour is there guys but it's it's a very it's such a small part it's such a small part of the bigger picture that the you know for those who hopefully this spring will have our fashion show will be back to normal um but for the students who have participated in that situation, you have four months of working on a collection that you will hate by the time the semester is done. You will be so tired of looking at it. You'll be so tired of, you know, breathing that. And then you have to do fittings. You have to do practices. We have to pick the right music. Um, we have to find the right look, the right accessories for 30 seconds on the runway. All of that for 30 seconds on the runway, you might walk down the runway too, you know, at the end, clap, clap, clap. And then the business starts again, the business of selling what you just spent six months, you know, sleepless hours, you know, you haven't eaten, you've had three breakdowns, you've cried, you, you know, you snapped at your mom, she, she nearly killed you for it. All of that for 30 seconds. And it has to be good. It has to be like, worth it those 30 seconds have to be on point and then you start again so when you watch those runway shows they're already they've already started the next collection they're just doing like they're just getting that part out of the way there's you know next collection starts so we don't tell you this to scare you we just remind you that if you love this that is it that is the commitment that is what is involved whether you do it for yourself 
or for someone else. Um, I think so. I think that was his lesson that he learned doing it for yourself and then doing it for someone else. There's some security in doing it for someone else. Yeah. It's a nice paycheck. Nice paycheck. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> In the beginning, it was for, it was for, <laughs> in the beginning, it's not because everybody wants to do it in the beginning. Everybody wants to do it in the beginning. Yeah. What do you think sets you apart um, as a designer, as a senior designer from, you know, others like those brands, you know, end up knocking on your door, which is very typical in the industry, guys. You don't, you generally don't stay with a company for more than five years, right? Three to five years is like the soft spot, you know, in between there. You've grown, you've developed, and maybe there's another jump and another company and that's what you know that's how you do those things so what do you think sets you apart from others at, at your level at where you're at i think what sets me apart is my passion um i have a deep passion for this uh, i design all the time um even if it's nothing that i'm actually working on um so i would say my work ethic and my passion um i believe i have strong skill a strong skill set um and sketching and fa uh, fabric selection and colors and also um color blocking and style style lines so i believe like those have been my visual cues or the key things that's that set me apart from other applicants and allow me to get a lot of the opportunities that i got awesome and you you've this is your fifth company this is my fourth company fourth company I'm not trying to speak anything to you. Is it Perry? It's fifth. Fifth Sorry. See, ha. <laughs> I know how to count. Um, <laughs> so this is your fifth company. And when did you know it was time? To, like it, each each time that you've made a switch, when did you know or have a sense that it was time for you to move to the next opportunity? Um, once I feel like I hit my ceiling, which means I'm pretty much I've the seat, like going through the seasons and it becomes redundant. Um, there's no inspiration there. There's nothing exciting about what I'm working on. It's just work at that point. Then that's when it's time for me to move on and, and go to something else. Um, because again, like I said, I'm very passionate about what I do. I like to stay on point um, as far as like with my new collections and how I'm working through the season and the things that inspires me. So. If I'm not being inspired by the company anymore and the direction is just to go ahead and do what we've been doing, then I know that that place isn't for me anymore and it's time for me to move on and find something that's more for me. And every time you leveled up, what has been the, what's been the, the learning curve for you? Um, the learning curve is just going into a new company, learn, uh, learning new processes like, um, and also just learning your new teammates, um, who does what, um, who can help out here and who do you go to for this, this, and this. Um, so pretty much that. Awesome. Um, do we have, oh, we have a, an audience member, Professor Penn. Hi, how are you? I'm Hi. the professors here. You're speaking to the mic. Oh, yes. This is one of the first pattern making and construction class. So I would like you to tell them exactly the fundamentals, not from where you are now, but in the beginning, how it really, really, really was, okay? And all the experience that you learned that you did not know when you had your own business, mm -hmm. okay? I know you went over that again, but yeah. I just want that to sink into them because I tell them all the time, it's not a red carpet event all the time. And it's like Asanya was saying, it's a few minutes for the fashion show, but all the work that's involved and all the different components that have to come together for that fashion line to be shown to a buyer mm -hmm. or a merchandiser who's going to decide if they want the, the if they want the items or not. Yeah. So there's so much that you have to put into it. And it's like you said, it had you have to have a passion for this because you may work in a, in a job, you work from nine to five, but in something like fashion or any other kind of business, <laughs> it's going to be 12 hours, maybe 13 no hours, 14. It doesn't yeah. matter yeah. when the work gets done, when it really looks perfect, because these people are expecting perfection from you. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of competition out there from all over the world. So your merchandise really has to stand out. Yeah. So I repeat this to them every day. Maybe they think that this is me talking, but exactly what, you, what you're saying. And one thing also that Prisca was saying, when you have your own business, it consumes you because you don't have the budget or the resources to expand. So when you go and work for a company, 
you learn so much and you meet so many people and so many contacts yeah. worldwide that eventually may help you and may need you at some time also. Yeah, if you guys so, if you guys think yes. about the the designers that are taking off right now, mm -hmm. let's call them creative, um, like the Matthew Williamson's, if you talk about the Kirbidos, if you talk about the con, well, mm -hmm. you talk about the <laughs> no comment. Um, <laughs> but those guys behind the scenes are buddies, they're collectives, they 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 break bread together. You have to find the way you're gonna find other people that have other strengths that you don't have is when you work with them and you build those relationships, like he says, that's your network. And so when the time comes that you're ready to launch your business, and if you talk about, I mean, we think about, you know, designers that have launched their own brands, eventually they, when they leave a company to start their own thing, they pull friends with them that have certain skill sets because they've worked with you, they see what you're about. And they're like, oh, you want to come with me to go start this this brand over here, I think we could do something amazing. We have a similar aesthetic. So those connections are made in the industry, working for someone. Um, you don't have the money to pull them away from a brand that's paying them a proper paycheck. So unless you, they work with you and see what you do and how you vibe and how you develop and how you create, it's a lot easier when the time comes to walk away and say, okay, let's go do our own thing. I think we, we can do it. And those guys are, are all buddies. They're all friends. You know, if they follow each other on social, they, they big each other up. They're all buddies. They're all friends. They're, they're helping each other navigate the industry as a collective. So don't think it's like, you know, rising star without, there's always going to be a conversation in the back room about who should take over what. And it's because they have that kind of connection, the kind of support. So I think that's, that's something that you should also take into consideration when you decide, do I want to just go start my own thing and work for a couple, work for someone for a little bit. That's how you know who's out there doing stuff and what, the, and what their value could be to you eventually if you launch a company. That work experience is important. Yeah, it is. Um, so just to go back to your question. Um, so basically in the beginning, um, at school level, you're learning everything. You're learning how to do everything that it takes teams to do within a company so learning pattern making pattern making is probably the most challenging thing i know it was for me um most challenging thing you could do within the industry because everything is based off of numbers and and um and cuts and different things that that's 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 in a pattern which is involves fit it involves um length and and, and waste measurements. So I think um, if, if I, I respect the pattern makers, the pattern makers are the ones that is in the grind, they in the trenches and getting it done. So, um, but, but, and there's also the, the sewing process too. So the pattern maker and the sewer is right there hand in hand. So um, usually the pattern maker is giving instructions to the sewing person um, on how to make the garment. So that's another one that, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of grind and it's a skill. So um, just that, like those jobs right there are in a company. There's, there's a team to do all of this stuff and there's programs and software to get all of that work done. But when you're doing it by yourself versus working with somebody else, it's just, it's so much work and you just have to understand what, what section of the industry that you want to be in? Do you want to be a pattern maker? Do you want to be a seamstress? Or do you want to, do you want to be a designer? Or do you want to be a technical designer? Um, there's so many different levels to it, but um, it all entails work in the end. So it's definitely a big grind. Thank you for your question. So um, we have some um, questions from Zoom because you know we're not alone, even though we're alone. Um, so I'm going to ask Celso to just grab a mic and, and ask the question because um, um, I hate reading from my phone. Okay, hi. Uh, this is from Stephanie Navarrete. She says, in his, in his time off, what are things he did to strengthen his portfolio to go back into the industry? So I did a bunch of sketching. I sketched every day. Those, um, those croquis that I showed. Um, it's pretty much what I did. I built my own stories. I came up with collections. 
um, inspiration and things. I looked on the internet. I looked at what athletes was doing. I looked at, at, I kept my foot into the industry and basically continued to um, grind and, and as far as learn. Um, so but the biggest of my work I did was sketching. So that that helped me um, because certain companies would like, like hand sketching and certain companies don't. They like Illustrator. But I felt like that was a skill set that I was missing and I had lost when I was in college and I wanted to strengthen that up. And that sets you apart in the industry because not a lot of people still hand sketch. So it was a lot of sketching. Um, and I think Elaine, Elaine, I don't want to mispronounce her name, so I'm not going to do that. Um, she's like, you need to teach a class. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll work on that. Well, this is a professor. Uh, I am a professor here. Hi. And I teach mathematics, but I'm impressed by your journey. I am. I don't teach classes on Friday. And I'm, I'm shocked. You are, you are beyond amazing. And the reason why I make that comment is the following. As a mathematician who teach teenagers, I teach full-time. I'm a full-time professor. I like fashion, but of course, my, my thing is math. And I've been teaching at Miami-Dade College forever and ever. You know, I, I reached a high. And it's not even that, but I do think that since you got your AA with us, um, I'm very he thankful. Didn't, he didn't get it with us. Well, it doesn't, that's an even more, well, the whole, I'm thankful for you and for whoever is, uh, um, made it for him to agree to, to give a talk. I, I was looking, there are about 20 something kids, nobody's old like me watching him. It's the kids who need him. But I do believe that somebody got to offer him something so he can at least for one semester, whenever it's convenient for him. It's not for him to teach for free, but he knows that if he makes it really big in the fashion world, He's going to be making five times more than we all, but that's not a reason for him to do because he got to be an inspiration. If he's self-motivated, if he made it in this world by his own drive, a lot of these kids, Brittany, Anna, Nat, Allison, all the names that I'm reading here, they need him and many more people. So baby, find a way. You know, I do a lot of help for the Miami-Dade College kids. Thank you. They need you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, Damar is here. This is one of the reasons that he flew out, apart from me bribing him, <laughs> you know, um, to, to, to be here. But we have these talks for the very purpose of, of giving everyone a chance to speak to folks that have gone through the industry, who have a similar background, who have a similar um, interest in fashion, um, but also just to help you guys see how it really is you know I know um and when we have our advisement session with you we, we, we try to make sure that you have a real sense of what you're getting involved in um so it's really really uh, an opportunity for you guys to ask questions and as Damar said before network connect um he is a senior designer now and he will probably be a creative director at some point um in the near future um that's a connection point um, you know, you have internship coming up in the spring or summer, maybe they have an internship program, um, you know, we allow you to go out of state for it. So this is, you know, it's one of the things that we can offer you um, as a chance and opportunity to network with folks that you would not meet otherwise. So uh, that for us is, is big. Um, if, and if you ever want to teach, you know, I'll make it happen. But, <laughs> but I, you know, he, he's just, he's just getting to the point now where he has a life, a work life balance. So I'm not going to ask him to do too much. Um, we appreciate him being here. Um, do we have any other questions, Kelso? Uh, we have a comment. This is from Jordan Jackson to everyone it says, love hearing your story, bro. Keep walking the walk and inspiring the next generation. Is that a friend? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it, bro. You gotta have you have friends to pick you up. Um, do we have any other questions in the audience? Uh, anyone who's curious, got some? Uh, please, right here. Hi. Women's fashion is usually a little more diverse, and there's a lot. But in men's fashion, would you say the sports line that you're on is what sells the most? Um. Yeah. 
um, that's basically based off of the brand. Um, Adidas is a sports brand. And then the brands that I've been with in the past are sports companies too. So um, we usually tell those stories and, and kind of sell our items through a sports lens first. And then we tell it through a lifestyle lens. So um, it's diverse in that way because sport is different. You can take inspiration from different sports and combine it into one sport, or you can just go deep dive into that sport that you're working on and truly pull that grassroots inspiration from there and build from there. So it's very diverse in that way. Um, just like women's wear. Women's wear, I believe, is just more, it's more glamorous. It's more, yeah. It has it's more of an appeal. It's more of the epitome of fashion. And menswear is right there too. It has those points, which in which is in suiting and and, and things mm -hmm. like that, but it's not as diverse as the women's. But sport is pretty diverse and you can come up with a lot of creations and a lot of ideas and stories from that. And don't you feel that we're having like a renaissance now in menswear and in just general? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A lot lots more interest in menswear than there's ever been. I think women's wear kind of got boring as a result, but whatever. Um, any other uh, questions in the audience? No, you can't get Yeezys. No, no Yeezys. No free Yeezys. <laughs> question. It's a question. Oh, one second. Tell the students what it was like when you traveled overseas to Europe. Oh, yeah. Just the difference of that whole lifestyle. Yeah, Europe is totally <laughs> different from the U.S. Um, it's, it's cool. It's like the 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 living spaces are a little bit more sh are smaller than than it is here but it's cozy and it's comfortable and they eat you know obviously they eat different than us um you know i'll eat a sandwich at lunch and they'll eat a sandwich in the morning so it was different to learn the culture i was actually in stockholm sweden so that was definitely different from london or germany or anywhere else i've been awesome any other questions uh, my question was actually previous, um, was actually related to hers. We know that women clothing is more diverse than men, but my question is, you don't think there's any ways that we can make men clothing more diverse, or it's just a, you know? Well, right now it is. That's what we were just saying. Like trend wise, m women's wear has gotten kind of boring. You're just seeing a lot of skin. It's not very interesting. <laughs> um, no, it's the truth. I mean, we've just gotten to the point where we're just showing a lot of skin and and. If you're in fashion, you know that doesn't require a lot of skill, right? Mm -hmm. um, but menswear has gotten so much more love lately. You're seeing, I mean, from all the, the fashion shows, there's just so much more interest because it, it was flat for a while. And so now you're playing with colors, you're playing with cuts on suits that you never saw before. Um, I don't know, athleisure being kind of at the forefront of the category that's selling the most right now allows for menswear to take off even more within sports. So even though he's doing uh, lifestyle um, or, you know, um, other things that focus on like active life, most of us aren't active, right? That's America's problem. Most of us aren't active. So we have, we're wearing active wear, but we're not even being active, but that's the top selling category in the world, right? And that is, predominantly a male space so it's it is getting it is the most diverse as, as if you're looking for diversity and and ways to experiment you're experimenting with fabrics you're experimenting with color we've gotten past the whole pink is for girls blue is for boys like we've gotten past that thank god um so you're you're experimenting now in ways that you never would so if this is if you're gonna do stuff within menswear especially since we're talking about um unisex we're thinking about transgender we're thinking about all those different spaces you're not going to find a more creative time for menswear than probably right now sorry jumped into that one uh, <laughs> uh over here we have another uh so -so. one second um i was just is this on? Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, I know you're doing like, you work with specific basketball players and you do like the lifestyle, like sportswear, but do you ever work on actual uniforms or is that a whole separate? Thing? Um, I don't work on uniforms. Um, my counterpart, Irvin, he works on uniforms. So he works with the, uh, the universities and everybody who Adidas sponsor. Um, I work on the, me and my counterpart, 
we both work on the uh, the lifestyle and the signature collections for basketball and also the inline range, which is inline is basically our regular range for everybody. It's not attached to an athlete. Yeah, the, the basketball professional leagues usually have contracts. So with a brand. So I think right now, the majority of the leagues are with Nike and then so on and so forth. And, and then that's basketball and then there's football and then there's soccer and then there's rugby and then there's, so it depends on what category and what league they're in. And there's the G league and then there's the professional league, there's, there's college league. So when I say this is compartmentalized, it is compartmentalized and it's all based on contracts and who's committed to who for how long. question. Um, how did you find all these different opportunities with the big companies? Um, was this before the internet? Did you reach out like through writing a letter? Did you know someone? I'm just wondering how you found all the individual opportunities? Yeah, so um, that's a great question, actually. Um, basically, um, I'll start from the beginning. Um, to get your start in the industry, there's job. they'll post a job saying assistant designer, which is entry level. But they also post that they want one to two or three years experience. So that's where internships come, in, come in, in, involved. So it's basically once you get your foot in the door, then it's, it's what you do from there. So once I got those internships and I got my foot in the door, I was able to use that experience from Perry Ellis to build my portfolio, to build my networking, and also put myself out there as far as um, being desirable for an employer so it takes it takes that first step to get it because then you're competing with other people that is within your title range so um those opportunities came at times where they were looking for either they were looking to do some new business initiative within the company and i was the right fit for it or an opening came through because someone left um so Getting those opportunities is just pretty much uh, how you put yourself out there. How's your portfolio looking compared to everybody else that's applying for those jobs? So you're not competing with yourself. You're competing with a bunch of people that wants the job just as much as you do. So um, I would say, you know, the grassroots of it is start with the internships, start building your experience that way, get some, re get some names on your resume, and then those names on your resume will be the interest for a recruiter to call you and, and will want to offer you the job or, or whatnot. So it's about once you, what you do once you get into those opportunities, how that portfolio is looking. As a designer, your portfolio is everything. That's what's going to get you that look over the next person. So, And also, once you get to a certain point in your career, you know, um, there will be headhunters that call, right? So like every, com every company kind of poaches from other companies, um, which is why I said that we don't usually stay in a, a position with a brand for more than five years because someone will eventually call you and like, hey, um, you know, we, there's a position with a company. I can't tell you the name of it, but they're looking for X designer. Would you be interested in have, you know, entertaining a call or taking an interview? But that's usually a, after a few years into the industry, then they'll they'll know who you are because they they poach from other companies, meaning that they'll they'll scout who's working for Adidas. Somebody from Puma knows who works for. Oh, he works for. OK. And then there's conferences. Well, you'll see people working at your same level at a conference and you'll talk to each other and a position will come open. They're like, oh, you know who who's over at this company that, you know, he seems pretty dope. We should reach out to him. So it happens after like you've been in there not for a while, not a long time, um, but it starts to happen more and more that you'll get calls when positions open up because you've made those connections. Anywhere, the same place everybody else looks. Yeah, indeed, you know, you can go onto the company site that you're interested in. There's, the company will have their own site. There'll be job postings on major sites. It's this, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ellis. Uh, thanks again for being here, Demar. This is really cool. Thank um, you. <clears throat> as the uh, educator in the room, or as one of the educators in the room, of course, I got an education question. So um, you, you mentioned in your story that you got an associate's degree <laughs> in part because you couldn't afford to get a bachelor's degree. 
Um, and I know that, uh, I don't know if it's all the students in, at MFI are in an associate's degree program. I don't know if you have a bachelor's. Nope. Um, so uh, I guess my question is more, uh, obviously you've carved out a very successful career for yourself with an associate's degree. So I uh, just wanted to get your take on the importance of education in the industry, maybe uh, some roadblocks that you may have run into or encountered because of uh, maybe a lack of education or maybe things that you've pursued, some educational experiences that you've pursued outside of a formal education, like a degree program. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned some internships and stuff like that. Um, uh, but I just wanted to hear your take on uh, the importance of getting an education versus a formal education uh, in the fashion space. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the importance of getting an education is is super important. It's, it's your entry entry point into being able to have somebody look at your application and take it serious. Um, the, the drawbacks in the industry um, for having an associate's degree is that a lot of companies require a bachelor's degree. So if you don't have that bachelor's degree, they won't even look at you or they won't even consider you. Like for example, Nike, they hire bachelor's degrees. I have an associate's degree. I applied there a few times. I never got a response. Not because I have an associate's, I don't, I don't know if it's because I have an associate's degree or whatever, but, um, and some companies also waive that. They, they look past that. They, they base it on your, your portfolio, your, um, your resume and your history. So um, I've, I've encountered myself just drawbacks to not having that bachelor's degree, but it, it never really stopped me from achieving or getting to different opportunities that I wanted to get to. So um, that's the base level. Education is so important. Um, you can't even you can't even step foot in the industry without having a, a some sort of a degree. So I would I would encourage that for anybody um, if they want to get in this industry, you have to have an education. Now, the level of education is based on you. Some people go for bachelor's, which is basically more training and more experience. I chose the the route of going for internships because I wanted true true to life work experience and also I wanted to get some companies on my resume. So it's it's um it's it's a bit of a struggle, but again, that education is the base level for any entry point into it. And you have to have it just to even get an internship because companies won't pay you unless you go into a degree or you unless you're in a degree program or in a college that to where you can get your foot in the door. Um, Celso, you had a you had a, a question from the audience. Yes, yeah, just uh, along the same lines that what is uh, he speaking about? Uh, Max says, "How can you put yourself out there for companies outside of internships? A lot of internships are unpaid, and a lot of students can't balance school, unpaid internship, and another job to support themselves." Well, it's kind of what I was saying at first. You you do what you got to do to get to where you want. Um, the entry point in this industry is to get companies under your levels or under your belt. So you have to have an internship, basically, um, unless you know somebody that can just get put your foot in the door. And it's, it's not easy. Um, I did it. I was in I was working a job. I was in school full time and I was interning. So it's a, it's a lot to juggle. But this industry is not something that is going to be handed to you or somebody is just going to give you an opportunity. You have to have shown that you can put yourself out there and that you're willing to work for it. So I understand the life part of it, but it's a sacrifice. But suck it up, basically. Um, so one of the things that I wanna reiterate for our students tonight, we say this to you, but I, maybe it doesn't translate, but fortunately, Damar has shared it in a different way. Um, we pursue articulation agreements with upper division schools to give you options, right? It doesn't mean that you can't take your associates and go work, but like he's explaining, there's two routes, right? You can go work, but that work in the beginning is gonna be sacrifice, right? Because there's companies that won't even entertain you because you don't have a bachelor's. And you know you can argue fair or not fair, but that's just what it is. It's their way of filtering, right? It's, it's their way of like, if, if, a, if a thousand people apply to work to Nike, make it Nike, and they do, <laughs> um, they can say, okay, well, if you don't have a bachelor's, I'm not even looking at you, right? 
Um, and that's their way of filtering. And so it's way companies use to filter. We give you the option of going on to upper division so that you can get that bachelor's. And we try to do it with partners that can support you in getting the, the bachelor's. We don't say it's mandatory to succeed in the industry because it's obviously not mandatory, but it's just about the route that you choose to go. You can, there's two, they're both gonna be painful routes, <laughs> but it's the route that you choose to go and what you wanna do long in like long-term, right? If people ask me like, oh, should I get a master's? I'm like, well, it's about having options later on. You can get a master's now. Master's is probably one of the easiest ones to get. Um, there's like a, talk about it another time. But if you get a master's, it gives you options later on. If, if Damar wants to be a professor later on when he's ready to slow down and take it easy and maybe only goes to work maybe 30 hours a week and he's taking calls in the south of France, you know, and telling people what to do, he may want to step into a classroom every once in a blue moon just for fun. Yeah, I'd say, okay, go ahead and get that master's whenever, whenever you have the time because the, those schools are gonna require it. They're gonna ask for their paper. So it's, they're just routes, they're options, but each, each option, there's no pain-free option. <laughs> I don't wanna pretend that there is. It's just, they're options. You can go this way and if this way, then this is how that's gonna go. You can go that way. If you go that way, then this is how it's gonna go. There, it's just options. So keep that in mind when you're planning for the future because there is no guarantee whichever route you take. They're just options, right? Celso? Um, I just had one last question, especially with this education um, bent that we're going. As the head designer and you are, you know, you have a team, what is one uh, skill and also one quality that you're looking for in the people that you're, you're bringing into your team? Um, the quality and skill that I'll be looking for, it depends on the level. Um, if I'm looking at someone for an entry level position or for an assistant for myself, um, I'm looking to see if you know the basics. Do you know how to, the, the programs? Do you know how to sketch? Do you know how to actually construct a garment? Um, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for passion. I'm looking for um, just the will and not being afraid of doing the work. I'm also looking for what you've done in school and I'm looking at your book to see what projects you've done and how you've been able to translate that information to an actual design and how, how does those, um, connect, how does that story connect to what, what I'm seeing on paper versus what you explained the project to be. So I'm looking for a few things in a, in a, in a different level, an associate or a designer level. Uh, I'm looking at your background, I'm looking at your history, where you come from, what you've worked on. Um, and I'm, I'm looking to see if you're not afraid of the work and if you're a team player, are, are you a good fit for this team? So at different levels, I'll be looking for different things, but in all in all, uh, you're, I'm, I'm the key thing and the one thing that's common, I'm looking for the passion. Do you wanna do this? Can you do it? Anyone else? No? Do we have any, any Zoom questions? No? Awesome. So we know we ran through an hour pretty, pretty fast. Yeah. You're right. Um, I want to thank you again for coming through. Thank you. Um, you know, he was he was a good student. So that's that's why I asked him to come. I was like, oh, you're a good student. I liked you. You're cool. Um, bad students, I don't ask back. Um, but I really want to thank you for coming through, um, flying out here. Hopefully you're going to have a nice, decent uh, time while you're here visiting us. And um, to our audience who's actually physically here, thank you guys for joining us. To our Zoom audience, thank you guys for joining us. And we'll be back um, again next month with um, another guest. But first and, and foremost, a round of applause for Damar. <laughs> Um, and then again, thank you guys for joining us and we'll hopefully see you next time. Um, the recording will be available online if you need it. We'll post it somewhere. I'm not sure where, but we'll post it somewhere. And again, thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>